So some more warm season weeds. Purslane on the upper left. Purslane is just, if you haven't had purslane yet, you've got to go find yourself some purslane. Not now. It's, there's a, it's got a, a, a winter um, cousin that you can find right now, miner's lettuce, which has very similar properties. But it's more of a, it's not something that's in this talk because you've got to usually buy the seeds to grow it. Though I have ever walked onto old homesteads and seen a lot of it growing. If, it's, if it was there, it might still be there. Purslane is the second highest source of omega-3 fatty acids and therefore really good for us. It's actually, I think, probably superior because the first source is flax and you have to go ahead and get the seeds and then press them to get the oil out. And then the oil is going to be degrading immediately. You know, it's flax needs to be, flax oil needs to be kept refrigerated. It's very fragile. It's very, very good for us, but it's not the easiest thing to keep. Purslane, on the other hand, you don't have to do anything to it. You can eat it raw. In fact, that's one of the best ways to eat it. And indeed, if you want the omega-3 fatty acids to be perfect, that is the way to eat it. The stems are also good to eat. A friend of mine who was using our garden while we were away working at Highland Lake Inn cultivated or basically selected for a cultivar of purslane because she had looked up in Yule Gibbons, one of his books. Um, Yule Gibbons, by the way, in case you don't know, wrote Stalking the Wild Asparagus, which for my generation in the 70s introduced us to wild food. Uh, he was quite the character and he had several books, but the one I know is Stalking the Wild Asparagus. But in one of his books, he recommended that you use the stems for pickles. And my friend got into purposely selecting for bigger and bigger stems so she had really nice pickles. And so that is you know, what you can do with the two. I've never done that. And indeed, after she moved on, I didn't continue to select for big fat stems, but they can be used for pickles also. On your right, a little washed out picture, but it was the one that to me showed it in its, its strongest form is amaranth, also known as pigweed, because it takes over. <laughs> now, and pigs probably love to eat it too, but I think it's probably because they think it takes over. And then red root, because if you pull it up, the lower part of the stem going down to the root is red. That's kind of a sure way to ID it. This is, was a major food for, for Amerindians. Indians. It's high in protein in the leaves. The seeds are also edible. They want to be sure to rinse them really well because of saponins. But it's very abundant and one of the greens I eat the very most of. The other name for it is Callaloo, and I had the—I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Jamaica and do a little bit of consulting. And when I was there, I got to go to the market, and the farm that I was working with um, had brought Callaloo, that, but did not bring enough for the really strong demand for this green in Jamaica. And the uh, customers were pretty outraged that we were out of Callaloo. So it, they, there's a famous seafood um, stew or soup that's made using Callaloo, which I've never had. But someday I look forward to eating, eating it. And if anybody out there has got a great recipe, send it to me. Next time I get to the coast, I'll think about eating it or making it. Of course, I'll probably have to bring my amaranth with me because I don't think there's a lot of it growing on the coast. But there are some foods growing on the coast too, which I'm not going to get to tonight, unfortunately. All right, and then in the next two slides on the bottom, we have the leaves and the stems and then the roots of burdock. This is a biennial plant. You want to let it grow the entire season. If it's a weed, and you're going to harvest it. And then before it starts to go to seed the next spring, dig it. And you can see there's some pretty significant roots there. If you go to the store and buy this, the roots are all nice and straight. If you're foraging for the wild ones, they can often be very variable, but they're all very good to eat. And eat. They're incredibly good for you. They're really high in nutrients, and they add a really earthy flavor to stews and soups and stuff like that. You can also grate them into stir fries but they do need to be cooked enough, so I wouldn't necessarily do a quick stir-fry with it. You might find that they're a little bit crunchier than you want. Now, actually, the stems are also edible, but only the stems, and I have been served them by my friend Doug Elliott. That took a lot of work, because I've tried it. I mean, I would eat them if I was starving, but I would not, not necessarily eat them if I wasn't starving. Um, and I have also heard, though I haven't experienced um, myself, that the Leaves are good when mashed up for bruises, and they may have other medicinal uses too. Also, once again, there down in the lower left corner of the leaf portion of the burdock is ground ivy, which we'll get a closer look at later, and I will talk about more later. But it's there in this picture too. It shows up a lot. And then more summer, 
plants both weeds and some ornamentals that were surprising to me to learn that they're edible. The top left picture is cleavers, also known as bed straw. It's got a bunch of names that kind of talk about its properties when it's in flower particularly. It is known as cleavers because it's got almost Velcro-like hooks on its um, stems and on its flowers. And it, if you walk through when it's set its fruit, they're going to stick to you and then you're going to spread them. The part that's edible as a green is the young, kind of in the center picture there, you can see those young shoots and all that. They're, they're a really nice mild green and they can be very abundant. So they're very good for you. They're also medicinal. This is really good. Um, I know several um, herbalists who make a tincture of this and give it to people for getting the, the lymph to cleanse, to cleanse the lymph system. So it's a great tonic for the lymph system. And um, finally, it's related to coffee. And I haven't done this. I've actually several times tried to get myself to do it, harvested loads and loads of the dried fruits. Are the, the fruits when they're mature and then dried them. But if you can see how small they are, it's going to take a whole lot of them to collect. But I, I can imagine that if, you know, all, everything ground to a halt and we could not get to the store and buy coffee, which I want every morning, you know, which I really relish. It makes me happy to have every morning. Um, I might actually, you know, put all the work it would take into collecting enough cleavers to have coffee once in a while, cleavers fruits. I don't think I can collect enough to have coffee every morning, but it is related to coffee and people roast those seeds and, and grind them and make a coffee-like drink, which has less caffeine, but has caffeine. So that one, that was one of those amazing little facts that I, I really like. I don't know if I'm ever going to take advantage of it, but I like the idea of it anyways. And just to know that we've got a relative of coffee growing here in temperate North America, though only in the summer. I will grant that. And then another one that I've known I could eat forever and still haven't eaten. I'm really embarrassed to say this. I can't believe I let another season go by. I didn't get around to it, but hostas. Hostas are regularly eaten and prized in Japan. And at least one of my wife's friends has a yard full of them and has reported that she eats them regularly too. So I would joke lots of times if people would say, oh, I don't have any sun. I'd say, well, you can grow hostas and eat those because they don't need very much sun. But it's one that you might not think. And if, if we suddenly couldn't get food, Lots of people have loads of hostas growing, and they could be food too. And then this picture I took right from Baker's Creek, and they hopefully, Baker's Creek Seed Company, I'm going to give them a plug, and hopefully they won't mind that I took their picture. I couldn't find a good picture otherwise, um, and I haven't grown it recently, but I plan on buying their seed and growing it. This is a particular variety of Celosia that is excellent. And I have to go back and look it up. I'm sorry, I meant to put the name of it down there. I forgot, but I will look it up and add it to the resource page that is meant as an ornamental and a great dried flower. Celosia, you can make a, a drink, a tea from the flowers. I don't know what it tastes like. I haven't done it yet, but the greens are edible. And so you could grow a lot of Celosia and then when you need to thin it, you could be eating it. Or if we suddenly didn't have food, you could just go out and harvest your Celosia for food. So that's Quite a surprise to me, but not not all not as surprising as, as I might think when I think about the family. And then in the lower right corner, you have both peonies and daylilies growing. And daylilies might be one of the better known edible flowers. They're in the onion family. I get a bit of an onion flavor from them. And you can eat the buds or the flowers. They're quite edible and quite tasty and abundant as can be. You have no, there's no shortage of daylilies, that's for sure. And then, I believe actually the roots might be edible too, but you'd have to look that up, but I'm pretty sure they are. And then finally, peonies. Peonies are edible, both the flowers and the leaves. And the flowers were used a lot in medieval times. So, pretty fun that a lot of your yard is edible. One that I don't have on here that I really want to taste before I go further. I didn't get around to tasting the berries of it until they were quite old and dried and they were not exciting at all but they might be quite exciting when they're young. And that's crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle is a lovely plant. It's all over the southeast and the berries are edible and the leaves can be used like bay leaves. So I'll let you know next year. A lot of these things, researching for this, I realized I haven't eaten this yet and I'm not gonna claim I know how something tastes if I haven't had it. 
but I plan on eating it next year and I encourage you to experiment once you've thoroughly identified and let me know if you've got any favorites or if it's in the category of famine food. We're gonna to get to that. Some things are edible, but that doesn't mean we wanna eat them unless we have to. All right. And another one that really surprised me on the left, goldenrod. Goldenrod, it's all over the place. It gets a bum rap as being the source of hay fever. Its pollen is very heavy and is not, it's, it's moved around by insects. You are not going to experience um, goldenrod as a, as, as a source of, of allergies, even though people think it is. It's, it is the ragweed that's causing the, causing the allergies. It's not the goldenrod. So don't go wiping out the goldenrod because on the left, you can see it's an incredible insectiary. Once again, aphids have taken over this plant. And if you look really carefully, right above the ladybug, which everybody knows probably, on the right, there is a lacewing larva, which is, has an aphid in its jaws. So it's quite a, quite a, these, these particular aphids are the, are the goldenrod aphid, and they show up in late spring around here, or very early summer, and they cover every, every goldenrod most years. Some years there aren't any, you can't tell with insects, but most years they're on almost every goldenrod. The goldenrods do fine, and meanwhile, all the beneficial insects have an incredible protein buffet for several weeks in the spring. But on the left is the, the plant and flower. People make tea from the flowers. And then the greens, probably before they go to flower, are reportedly edible, and I've yet to cook them. But it's amazing to think about it because there's a lot of goldenrod everywhere. It's, there's many different um, varieties of it, but there's a lot of goldenrod out there. And then one that at least in my lawn and all over here in Western North Carolina is abundant, is violets. And most of these are edible. You wanna make sure and identify it and look up the specific one, make sure that it's edible. I think there's one that might not be edible. But mostly they're great e eating. And years ago I read Susan Weed's description of all the medicinal qualities of violets and it is an incredibly medicinal plant. I don't remember those right now, unfortunately, but it's, it's got a lot of medicinal qualities, but it's kind of the idea of Food is medicine. It's not so much I think that people make medicine from it, it's that they eat it because it's good for them and it's good for some specific maladies too. So that's another one. Of course, lovely, you can definitely decorate your salads with, with the flowers, but the leaves are also edible and it's very abundant.